Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. My name is Lauren. I am the Open Education Librarian um, at the libraries, and I'm also the liaison to the Communication Studies Department. And I'm here with my colleague, Ted. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Kuobalo. I'm the Instructional Technologies Librarian. I am liaison to um, computer uh, science and electrical and computer engineering, physics and astronomy, and uh, engineering sciences and applied math departments. And I also lead services at Mud Library um, with um, the Maker Lab and the video production studio, Will, which I'll talk about that uh, later uh, during this session. And I'll give it back to Lauren. Thank you. All right, so um, in this presentation, we're going to talk a just a little bit about national and local course affordability statistics. Um, we'll talk about how to obtain course materials through the libraries, um, specifically eBooks, OER, Open Educational Resources, and course reserves. Um, we'll also talk about uh, what your subject librarians can do for you if you haven't already utilized your subject librarians. Uh, and then Ted will go over the video production studio and talk about Lightboard and, and different ways that you can use that. Okay, so to frame our conversation about accessibility of course materials, um, I just wanted to share some statistics about the textbook industry. Um, I've received questions in the past about the difference between the textbook publishing industry versus things like university and academic presses. And I just want to be clear to differentiate the two. Um, so the textbook publishing slash course material industry um, is represented in these stats. So that's a $3.10 billion industry. Um, there has been a 12% average increase of the price of textbooks with each new edition. Um, over 1,000% increased costs of textbooks between 1977 and 2015. Um, 38% is the amount textbooks outpaced inflation between 1977 and 2015, um, and then 192% of the amount of textbook inflation outpaced consumer price growth. Um, so of these um, stats, these stats reflect the price increases primarily from uh, publishing companies such as Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and Cengage, which provide a lot of the textbooks that we use here at Northwestern. Um, the rapid rise in costs has had an impact on students at Northwestern um, and nationally. These are national um, figures on this slide. So this is 65% of students reported skipping purchasing a textbook because of cost. 21% skipped purchasing access codes because of cost. 37% of faculty do not know the cost of course materials when they select them for their classes. Um, and then 37% uh, cost per student increase for e-textbooks over 12 months. Uh, and some of these stats are from, published in 2022 and 2021, so they're pretty recent. But what about Northwestern? Um, sometimes we think Northwestern might be different from national statistics. Um, in a uh, 2022 Canvas Satisfaction sur Survey, students were asked about the cost of courses and how it impacts their educational experience. And many indicated that they either avoid certain classes, withdraw or drop, or go without buying all of the assigned course materials. Um, so it was 53% combined um, stated that they do that. So it's definitely still impacting Northwestern students as well. So how can we help? Um, with those stats in mind, you might utilize resources in the library to provide free access to course materials to your students. Um, these are the primary ways that we can make course materials available to students are ebooks, open educational resources, course reserves, and chapter scans. So, in addition to collecting print materials, the library also provides access to ebooks. So, when you are creating your syllabus and selecting your course materials, a good practice is to contact your subject librarian to find out if the materials that you're assigning are available through the library for your students to access. Um, one thing to know about ebook access through the libraries is that many publishers, especially textbook publishers, one that I, the ones that I mentioned previously, um, will create ebooks. So if you do a Google search, you'll see that the textbook that you're assigning is available in ebook version, but that is typically only available for an individual user license, meaning that that one student can access that ebook. So when libraries purchase access to ebooks, um, it 
it's preferable to, to have it be a multi, multi-user license, meaning that more than one person can access the ebook at a time. Um, and when, when those books are available, then we can make it available via our catalog and then anybody with the net ID and password would be available to access it. <clears throat> So when possible, um, the library will purchase and make available ebooks for classroom use. Um, so just reach out to your subject librarian if you're not sure if the book is available um, within the catalog. Uh, not all books are available as ebooks for multiple users, and that is especially true of textbooks and course materials. Um, and just feel free to reach out to your librarian about any ebook questions that you have. Um, here is a slide that has, um, this is a simple list of the most commonly um, uh, used textbook publishers uh, at Northwestern and beyond. And these are the ones that um, do not make available e-textbooks with multi-user licenses. So if you're currently using a Pearson, Cengage, um, Hotland, Mifflin, Harcourt, McGraw-Hill, or Oxford Uni University Press textbook division book, then the library wouldn't be able to get access to that as an ebook. So another option to consider when planning your course materials are open educational resources. Uh, OER are free teaching materials that are intended to be widely distributed and modified to fit the particular needs of instructors. Uh, OER are course materials that have been given an open license by their creator, which means that others can use the materials freely. So um, if you have come across an OER or if you're interested in creating an OER, one thing to know is that you would still retain the copyright um, to whatever it is that you create. Anything that we create um, in a tangible form, we automatically own the copyright for that. But with OER, it's somebody who's assigning an open license that works in conjunction with the copyright so that you're allowing others to use it freely without asking permission. So this is a rapidly growing area within academia, and there are lots of places that you can go to find OER within your subject areas. Uh, the first place that I usually recommend, especially if you're looking for a full open textbook, is the Open Textbook Library. So we're part of the Open Education Network, which manages this library of open textbooks. Um, it is full of full textbooks, so not just partial chapters or modules or bits of content, but full textbooks. Um, and they're designed for use at quarter or semester-based schools. All of the textbooks that appear within the Open Textbook Library have been used in at least two um, classrooms before at academic institutions. And many have been reviewed by faculty and they're sort of comprehensive reviews so you can get a feel for um, the quality of the, of the book. Um, one of the great benefits of OER is that you can make changes to text. So you can move chapters around, you can change problem sets, uh, you can delete chapters, um, or you could add different definitions. So the library is available to help with that process. So if you go to the Open Textbook Library and you find a text that you might want to use, but it's just not quite right, um, you can be in touch with us. And that's some of the support that we provide is reformatting and being able to publish something um, that is your own. The other OER search tool that I've included here is called Oasis Geneseo. Um, this was created by the folks at SUNY Geneseo, and it contains many full textbooks, so there might be some overlap between this OER repository and the Open Textbook Library, but it also has a lot of smaller pieces of open content, such as lecture slides, syllabi, course modules, videos, podcasts, and classroom activities. So um, if you attended the presentation on multiple means of representation uh, and you're looking for additional streams of content to incorporate into your your class, that would be a good place to check. Um, or if you're just interested in exploring using open educational resources, but you're not ready to take a dive into a full open textbook, check out Oasis Geneseo and see if there are any smaller bits of content in there that are relevant for your courses that you could begin to incorporate. And finally, if you can't find any existing OER that is suitable for your course, or maybe you have an idea for an openly licensed project, we can work with you to develop custom course materials. So we provide consultations. Um, we assist with finding suitable OER to build upon. Um, we also help with OER production and hosting. Um, we just recently signed a contract with Pressbooks, uh, which is a platform that specializes in OER publishing, and it comes with 
plugins that provide interactive exercises. Um, so I, I think it's really exciting for people who want to be able to have an interactive custom text. Um, we can also ensure accessibility and then promotion and sharing of your completed project. For those of you who are here and teach undergraduate courses, you might also be interested in Northwestern's OER faculty grant program. Basically, the program was created um, as a way of creating incentives to give to faculty so that they would swap out their commercial textbook or their existing course materials um, to create open educational resources. So we award $5,000 for faculty to swap out their commercial textbooks and course with course materials that they've created. Um, one other quick side note, the image on this slide is of an open textbook that was created through the OER grant program. Um, this one is uh, in the form of a web book. It's an HTML website, but OER are also available as PDFs and EPUBs. So if you teach a class and it's important that your students have access to print materials, um, it is possible to print OER. And I've actually spoken to the bookstore and it's possible to be able to print OER and make a print version available at the bookstore if that's something that you want to be able to provide for your students. Okay, um, so next up, I'm going to cover course reserves and chapter scans. Uh, so the library has physical course reserves. This is where if you have assigned a textbook in your course and you want students to be able to have access to that book at the library, even if we don't currently own that book, um, you can place a request through your Canvas course for physical course reserves. The library will purchase that book and then we'll make it available to students at the library. Um, course Reserves offers a shortened loan period so that uh, students can come to the library and they can get it for between two and I think six hours. Um, and then they can check it out. There's free scanners in the library so they could scan it if they want to and then they return it. Um, I like Physical Course Reserves as an option because it gives students at least one um, point of contact with the book where it is completely free and it is available. Um, and it can be helpful too for students who have ordered a copy of the book, but they haven't yet received it or they're waiting for it to ship. They can stop by the library and do their readings and then return it. Um, we also have e-reserves. So um, we're referring to e-reserves as alternative course packs. Um, if you are currently using a course pack in your course and maybe going through Quartet, the printing company, to print it. Um, one thing to know is that what students are paying for when they purchase access to that packet through Quartet is the licensing fee. So um, many times we have access through the libraries to the journal articles and book excerpts that you are possibly assigning within your course, um, but we have access to them because we pay for subscriptions to these resources. And so um, going through Quartet, they're paying for that copyright fee so that the student can then have access to it. But if you go through the library, then the student won't have to pay that fee. Um, so we don't have a service where we offer a print uh, course pack, but we do it through e-reserves where um, you can add the journal articles that you want to assign, or you can ask for scans of book chapters, and then all of those materials can be made available to students in Canvas. Um, one thing that we see quite often is that a lot of faculty um, have uh, PDFs of journal articles and other things that they want to assign in their classes. And they're already just on their computer. And so it's easy to upload the PDF to Canvas instead of going through a library database. But if you go through the library's database and provide a link to that resource so that when students click on it, they're brought to the library database so that they can read the journal article. What that is doing is increasing usage. So it's showing us, hey, look, people are using this they're accessing this journal, um, which means that it's more likely that the library would be able to continue funding to have that journal available. Um, and it's also the legal way to do it. So um, in Canvas, if you are assigning journal articles, we recommend going through New Search or you can contact your subject librarian to find the link to that journal article, upload it to Canvas as a module uh, and make it available that way. Um, we also offer offer book chapter scans. So um, if you have a textbook that you've assigned, but maybe you're only going to 
have students read one or two chapters. Um, instead of having students purchase the whole book, um, the library can scan those chapters and make them available um, via Canvas. Uh, one thing to note is that at this time, the course reserves department at the library is the one that determines fair use in this case. And so um, in order to comply with fair use, we can scan no more than 15% of an entire book. And so if you submit a book, say you want like seven chapters scanned, um, we wouldn't be able to scan that many chapters. It, it usually shakes out to about one or two that we can legally make available via Canvas. Um, we also offer streaming audio and video. So if you are assigning a movie or a TV show or something like that in your course, um, we have folks who can digitize that and then make it available so that you can embed that within your Canvas course. And it's the same deal um, with physical course reserves. If we don't currently have that content available in our catalog, we can purchase it and make it available if it's available to purchase. Okay, so um, I know at least one of you has contacted your subject librarian before, but um, we have subject librarians for every subject area, every discipline, and these are basically the contact people um, at the library for you. So if you have any questions about finding books or other materials or um, or you want some support for your class in the form of a library research workshop or referring your students to a librarian, um, contact your librarian. Uh, so your library point person is available to identify and find relevant materials. We also accept book and materials requests. Um, we're here for your research needs and then class support and instruction. All right, oh, now I'm gonna pass it over to Ted and he's gonna talk about the video production studio. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so the question comes to mind, why record videos? And this is uh, the part of the session where increasing instruction accessibility comes in. Uh, Michael Peshkin, um, he's a professor of mechanical engineering. He's a Breed senior professor and designed and actually the inventor of the light board. Uh, if you haven't heard of the light board, we'll, uh, we'll get that into, uh, put that more into detail. But, um, uh, in in any uh, case, uh, Michael um, put out an informal survey to his students back in 2021 and wanted uh, some thoughts on education and especially during the, the pandemic times. He received 130 responses, more than 75% of those responses um, mentioned how grateful videos were available to them in some form or fashion. Um, even like uh, surveys from major database platforms like IEEE and Web of Science put out questions like, "Is vid are videos useful for uh, for your students? Are are videos useful uh, for your audience?" Um, and even in the Canvas Minute digital newsletter, um, they said that recording videos might be called the next normal. Right. So if if you haven't been recording videos for your students or audience, uh, you might want to consider that uh, as uh, another form of communicating or connecting with your students. Uh, it does increase, uh, as I mentioned, accessibility and visibility uh, through sub several platforms. Um, it also gives you an option to do captions uh, when you're doing uh, videos as well. Uh, if uh, there are those type of needs um, within your within the group of students that you have, um, posting and embedding videos such as recording lectures, pre-class activities, assignment instructions can also be um, uh, another advantage uh, when you're um, uh, doing the type of LM LMS. Uh, platform that you have. Um, in this case, many instructors do uh, Canvas. In terms of reducing barriers uh, during the pandemic, uh, of course, time zones was very um, detrimental. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are teaching um, hybrid or on virtual classes, and if they're uh, uh, residing in different time zones, this is very useful. And then rewatching and reviewing videos for students can give you more accurate questions and feedback from what you're trying to teach 
teach them, um, not necessarily from the students, but uh, for the audiences that you're targeting when you make these uh, videos. So with the video production studio, um, there are two features uh, if you come and visit me at MUD. One is uh, the self-service feature, which was formerly known as One Button, uh, and the Lightboard. With the self-service, it's uh, traditionally where slides are presented in the back uh, while, you're, uh, while you're present in the front, uh, just like a, a traditional classroom setting. Um, with the light board itself, as you can see in the picture uh, in this slide, there's a large glass panel in front. Uh, slides are overlaid on the on the recorded video. And there is a short learning curve with the one hour workshop that I offer every quarter. But if you don't, it doesn't line up with your schedule. You can always contact me and I can um adjust my schedule and we could do a one-on-one -on -one consultation to see how the light board is done. So with this next slide, it gives you a little snapshot uh, um, of what, how, how the space is laid out and what, uh, what you can expect if you're in there. Where you can actually um, take a black marker and then uh, pre-mark it before you start recording, uh, even uh, before uh, you start uh, just presenting it uh, to an audience. So now I can come back and then I can look at this. They will not see the black marks on the video. And then if I go C CEO, CFO, and CIO, how are they all attached? I could just follow the black marks. And then who are under those are the three VPs. And when you're writing on the light board, you just look at it directly and then connect back to your audience. Now, if we take a look at charts, uh, you can pre-mark uh, before you start recording again and mark out the zero, zero mark with a black marker in the upper hand and then the limit on the, uh, uh, the right hand. And then, um, and then when you're talking about it, the, you can actually look at the light board. So first year, we went up to one and a half, and then the second year went back down to a half, and then all the way up on the third year. When you have content uh, in presenting data and statistics, uh, there's a bar graph, and when you want to highlight different uh, numbers, you'll highlight them and say, hey, these are the numbers that we're going to uh, talk about today and what we're gonna focus uh, as your uh, presenting material. Any slides that uh, we have um, that we present on the light board, it's usually a black background and the black color uh, makes it transparent uh, as we're um, presenting. And it also works with the black marker. You can see it in that video, uh, but when you see the final product, uh, you won't see the black marks uh, as, as a final product. It just It's just more of a guideline. So you, you're, your the way you talk the way you present is much more smooth as i mentioned before um uh registering for a workshop um um or an option to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me is uh more than uh doable um again this is uh this is such a a cool way to just uh, connect with your students and engaging rather than uh, a one-way communication. Uh, it's just very, very interactive with the slides that you're presenting. And you can pick and choose the interactive level that you want. Uh, how much do you want to write on the light board or how much do you want to present uh, for each slide as you go, go and record your video? Um, you can also reserve the video produ production studio on the um, on the library website. You could just search it, uh, and you could um, uh, take a look at the space yourself. But I would recommend that you could contact me, and then um, and then we would go over it together, uh, just to get you more uh, more. Um, I would say uh, start with best practices good best practices from the very beginning as you're um, taking a look at this uh, space and how you want to increase your accessibility, uh, instruction accessibility to your 
to your audience. So reviewing all the resources avail available to you, such as uh, informational how-to guides, um, creating a script, and familiarizing yourself, like as I mentioned before, with the VPS equipment. All this, uh, the more time you prepare for your presentation outside uh, the studio, the less time you'll spend inside recording. Uh, so that's what, what I, I would recommend. Uh, and I also mentioned that again uh, during the one-on-one -on -one consultation. It'll, it'll give you a much better uh, comfort level. Um, at first, you might get intimidated uh, and overwhelmed by all this, but in the end, uh, I think it'll be worth it for your students and how you interact uh, with your slides when you present it to them, especially um, a lot of uh, faculty members come in over the weekend, they record six or seven uh, five minute videos. And then once they record the videos, they give it to their students and say, review these videos before we meet the next time, and then we'll talk about it. And so I would say um, uh, 60% right now, uh, faculty members use uh, the video production studio on the light board and 40% um, is used by students. And it's increasingly changing. Students are using it more and more uh, as each quarter passes by because uh, they use their final presentation or their, their senior projects and they actually attach it to their resume. And the employers actually um, get impressed by how um, uh, the um, the video is made. Once you transfer the videos over to um, to your choice of platform where uh, file storage, uh, it automatically gets deleted from the computer that it's recorded. Uh, so I, I am always telling people to be careful, make sure they transfer all the videos they want before they log off the computer or else it's gone. So, and that's yeah. one of the, the things I, I reiterate. There are light boards um, in the Chicago campus, but they are specifically for the departments and they are specifically uh, used uh, if you're attached to a course. Uh, I don't know specifically where they are, but this is the only video production studio where it's open to uh, all uh, faculty, students, and staff. There are several other light boards on, on the Evanston campus. Again, they're limited to uh, the departments that they reside in. For Feinberg, there is um, video production support for classes, as Ted mentioned. Yes, and actually Feinberg came before they built their light board. They came over to our space um, to design their uh, their studio uh, with uh, with our setup in mind. So they came over to us first before they built uh, they built out theirs. So, and that's my part. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you take advantage of this resource that the library has to offer. Back to you, Lauren. Thanks. Uh, that's all that we wanted to cover today. So thank you all for your time and have a great day. Thank you all.